Americans for Prosperity North Dakota proudly supported important policy improvements that broke barriers for all North Dakotans this legislative session. From tackling unnecessary and burdensome occupational licensing standards to fighting for tax relief, AFP is proud to have played a part in improving the lives of North Dakotans this year. Join AFP today by visiting www.afpnd.org. This advertisement was paid for by Americans for Prosperity. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Coming up a little bit later in the show, Attorney General Wayne Stedgem is going to be talking about a process through which uh, folks, a, a streamlined process. It's a process that already exists in the state of North Dakota. There's a board that meets regularly to make recommendations on pardons to our state governor. And essentially what, what's going to happen is this board, this this commission, this committee, I'm, I'm forgetting what it's called now off the top of my head. But essentially, it's going to streamline the process so that folks who may have been convicted in the past of of petty marijuana offenses, they can basically make a um, make a very easy application or much easier than it is currently application to the board to um, to to have those offenses pardoned, which is even better. You know, in the past, we have talked about expungement. Uh, that was part of the the measure three ballot measure on the on the ballot in North Dakota here last year, uh, which uh, included a, a, an expungement provision, which is which is merely a uh, a sealing of records, which is of dubious utility in this era where you know these a lot of these records are online, and you know once that stuff is online, it never really goes away. A pardon really does mean you know the, the crime goes away. I mean, in, in a very legal sense, although you know. The fact that that you were arrested and, and convicted of a crime, uh, you know, may, may still be out there. Legally, you could say I have not been convicted of a crime. Now, the intent here is to help people who, uh, you know, may have been, you know, convicted of a petty marijuana-related offense in the past. But going forward, uh, you know, it, it, w- it would clear the way so that it's easier to get jobs, easier to get housing, things like that. So very interesting interview. That's coming up with Attorney General Wayne Stengem. Uh, before we get there, though, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. First, there was a report uh, from Jack Dura, Bismarck Tribune reporter Jack Dura, although it was reported to publications across the state. Very good report. I'm glad he, uh, I'm glad he reported it. Essentially, he went through and he saw, you know, how many absences state lawmakers took during the legislative session. And also how much pay they collected. Because one thing that state lawmakers do is they, it's sort of an automatic thing. If you ever watch floor sessions in in Bismarck, you know, a lot of times at the end of the floor session, they'll just do this routine vote to excuse absences. And by excusing those absences, they guarantee pay for everybody who's not necessarily there. So what Dura did is he went through and he found that absent lawmakers collected around $56,000 in pay during this most recent 2019 legislative session. That means pay for days that they were not in during the floor session. Now, that's the important part. They weren't there during the floor session. A lot of times, these lawmakers may have been there during uh, you know committee hearings or whatnot earlier in the day. They just weren't necessarily there for the floor sessions. And sometimes the floor sessions don't have a lot of important business going on. And sometimes if the weather's bad, lawmakers will leave early. I'm not making excuses for these guys, but sometimes, you know, they'll leave early and they won't necessarily attend the floor session because there's nothing really important going on during the floor session. They were there for all the committee work. They just didn't show up for the floor session. I don't know that that's necessarily a big deal. But what was interesting to me, because there's sort of been the usual sturm, sturm und drang about, uh, you know, oh, you know, these politicians and they're not showing up for work and we're paying them money and Trust me, if, if they weren't showing up for work for, for a good reason, then yeah, I'm I'm going to be angry too. But Dura's report, you know, he, he went and he looked at, at five lawmakers who missed more than 10 legislative days. So these are the people who missed most of it. Um, they represent about a third of that $56,000 in, in pay for absences that we're talking about. Um, the reasons why... Seemed pretty credible to me. Representative Dick Anderson, a Republican from Willow City, missed 11 days due to hip surgery. Representative Dwight Kiefert, a Republican from Valley City, missed 19 days because he had cancer. Representative Emily O'Brien, a Republican from Grand Forks, missed 51 days. Uh, She was pregnant. 
and she gave birth, and then she had some resulting health issues, and she ended up missing a lot of the legislative session. Representative Robin Wise underwent back surgery, missed two weeks, 14 days. uh, Senator Arnie Osland, Republican from Mayville, missed 16 days. He ultimately resigned, but he missed 16 days. Uh, He had a stroke. Now, I know these days it's, it's... fashionable it's in vogue to be you know have this populist rage and have this very cynical attitude about politicians but the thing is that these people are human beings too and serving in north dakota state legislature does not exactly earn you a financial windfall this last legislative session lawmakers were paid 495 dollars per month now they get paid that throughout the two-year cycle uh, they get that paid that throughout their their term in office. Uh, that's their basically, I guess you want to call it their salary, four hundred ninety five dollars per month. Now, when they're in session, on top of that, they get one hundred and seventy seven dollars per day. That's you know the months, you know the the con- it's it's no more than eighty days as constrained by your state constitution. But when they go to Bismarck and they actually meet during the legislative session, but you can't forget that they also have to go to interim committee hearings. Those happen regularly, at least once a month for these lawmakers where they have to travel from their homes to Bismarck for legislative meetings. They have to keep up. You know, legislators have to, you know, obviously listen to, uh, you know, the, the city governments, the county governments that are in their legislative districts. Uh, they have to meet regularly and attend those meetings on a regular basis. Uh, they have to meet with constituents. They're expected to go to constituent events. They're expected to go to town hall events. There's a lot of expectations that we put on our lawmakers, and they don't really necessarily have a lot of resources to handle all that. I mean, yeah, they get expenses, they get mileage and things like that, but also they don't have a staff unlike other states. They don't have, you know, somebody who can help them organize, somebody who can help them interact with constituents. Heck, most of these state lawmakers have, if if you look on the legislative website, a lot of them have cell phones and home phone numbers listed. That's a pretty special thing. It, to me, speaks to uh, a culture of public service which exists in the legislature. Now, pay for lawmakers is going up a little bit. As of July 1st, legislative pay went to $505 per month, a $10 per month increase. Uh, Their per diem during the legislature has gone to $181 today. It's still a pittance. They really don't make that much money. And frankly, if anything, I think they ought to be paid more. Because here's what happens. If you start getting too tough about lawmakers with, you know, uh, you know, excusing absences and we're going to deny them pay because, you know, they had cancer or something or we're having a baby. Or if we, you know, you know, get, get a situation where we're cutting their compensation down to the bone, the only people who are going to be able to afford to serve in our legislature, which, which, by the way, again, requires that you take months off from your life and career every two years to go serve down in Bismarck, not to mention campaigning, not to mention you know, the interim committee hearings, not to mention you know, meeting with, with all the local officials and everything in your legislative district. Uh, the only people who are going to be able to afford to do that are rich people or retired people. D- do we really want to limit the, the pool of potential public servants who could serve in the legislature by that much? I don't think that we do. But that's what we do. If we get up, start getting uptight about legislative compensation, that's exactly the outcome that we're going to achieve. We're going to have a group of people who, who could be very good state lawmakers, who could be very good public servants, very dedicated people who can't serve because they can't afford to. By the way, some of our legislative districts are absolutely huge. I always think of uh, State Representative Keith Kempenick and his uh, you know, f- uh, two fellow, uh, fellow representative and fellow state senator uh, serving over in District 39 in the far western, far uh, southwest corner of the state of North Dakota. That legislative district, if you look at it on a map, is roughly the size of Connecticut. Now, dotted throughout it, are, I mean, it, it touches on counties, it touches on cities, uh, and you know, those lawmakers who represent that area have to cover that entire area. They have to cover it when they're campaigning. They have to cover it when they're representing that area in office. They have to, you know, be responsive to those city commissioners that that are in their legislative district. They have to be responsive to all the constituents that live in that area. It's an area the size of Connecticut. And again, they have no office budget, no staff, nothing. So, yeah, if, if, if we had state lawmakers who were egregiously violating, you know, egregiously abusing these automatic excuses, you know, for, from legislative days during the session, then, oh, OK, let's get after them. 
but it's only an 80 day session. And I don't, frankly, for, for the pittance of money it is, again, this last legislative session, uh, total compensation for state lawmakers was just north of $3 million. We're talking about uh, roughly $56,000 in pay that was excused for lawmakers who were absent. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a problem. And the lawmakers have to consider, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bills during a very, very rapid Again, constitutionally constrained 80-day session. I don't know how much time I want to have them spend on investigating these absences. Because here's the thing. If you think your lawmaker's not doing enough good enough job showing up for work, well, you have the power of the ballot box to do something about that. The other thing I wanted to talk to you before we get to the attorney general is traffic fines. Now, in North Dakota, typically, if you get a ticket... It doesn't really matter which state agency was writing you that ticket. They could not exceed the state's level for fine. So if it was, say, uh, an expired registration, that currently will cost you, that's a $20 fine. Now, the thing, though, is that the legislature, this legislative session, it was a bill, Senate Bill 2304, uh, becomes effective in just a couple weeks, August 1st. It will, it will allow cities to treat traffic offenders through their law enforcement agencies differently than if that traffic offender was caught through a state law enforcement agency. So, again, for instance, a an expired registration tag would cost you $20 in state district court, like if, if a North Dakota Ohio patrolman issued you the citation. Uh, it would cost you $40 in Bismarck Municipal Court if... The city of Bismarck does, as the Bismarck Tribune has has recently um, reported, uh, impose traffic fines that are double what state law provides for. Now, the legislature cleared the way for this. Again, Senate Bill 2304, which becomes effective uh, on August 1st, cleared the way for this. Now, the problem, though, is, is it creates a situation where your, your responsibility, your, your punishment, I guess, for violating certain types of laws, traffic laws, would depend on the uniform the person is wearing who issues you the ticket. If it's a highway patrolman, it's one price. If it's a Bismarck City police officer, or eventually I imagine other cities would follow this lead, so a Grand Forks or Minot or Dickinson or whatever, if it's a local police officer, well, then your fine might be significantly more, maybe as, as much as double, which is what Senate Bill 2304 allows for. It allows for up to 100% more then, uh, you know, no more than double what the state fine is. Now, the thing is, is if, if we need traffic fines to go up, well, then fine, we can have that debate. And maybe we do need some of our, our, our speeding fines or whatever to go up. A lot of people have made that argument about North Dakota in the past. Our speeding fines are very low here. <clears throat> maybe we do, in fact, need those to go up. But I, I don't think we want to get into a situation where we have a city that's just juicing their their fines because I, then i think we're creating a situation where it's almost policing for profit where, where the motivation is not so much traffic safety but revenue and also i mean crimes should speeding in, in bismarck if you get picked up by a bismarck police officer should not cost you more than if you get picked up by a state highway patrolman or a county deputy I mean, remember, all of these law enforcement agencies have overlapping jurisdictions, right? The county jurisdiction overlaps with the city jurisdiction. The highway patrol's jurisdiction overlaps with both. So that's not such a good situation. Uh, Mark Fries, who's an uh, attorney based out of uh, the city of Fargo, works for the Vogel Law Firm. He has a guest post at sayanythingblog.com talking about this. He says that it's unconstitutional, and he says that this is almost certainly going to bring legal challenges. We'll see what happens with that. My interview with Attorney General Wayne Stenjum up next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com.
North Dakota Attorney General Wayne Stenjum joins me now. Wayne, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, Rob. Good to be with you again. Well, it's, I'm happy to have you on. And the reason I wanted to have you on is uh, headlines across the state, and I'm, I'm going to read one from my colleague, John Hageman. Uh, it reads, pardons for minor marijuana crimes to be eligible for streamlined application process. Now, marijuana, we've been debating it a lot. We had the medical marijuana ballot measure in 2016, and there was a whole you know legislative rigmarole that went into implementing that. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of administrative rulemaking and all that, all that jazz. We had a ballot measure in 2018 about recreational marijuana. Now there's a couple ballot measures and coming around. And then even during the legislative session, we had debates about, you know, decriminalizing marijuana and, and, and things like that. So, so just a lot of marijuana policy in general being discussed in the state of North Dakota. Uh, this streamlined this the streamlined application process for pardons where is this coming from is this new legislation that was passed is this something that already existed what is this no this is uh, something that comes from the pardon advisory board specifically something i'd been working on the pardon advisory board is a board that advises the governor on whether to grant pardons or not so it's not uh uh, is established by the Constitution. Actually, the, con- the governor has the authority to grant co- uh, commutations, pardons, and reprieves. He has this uh, five-member advisory board that I've sat on now for almost 20 years, and they have the authority to adopt policies. We didn't need a statute or even go through the administrative rule- rules process just to look at what we thought made sense as we look at uh uh, what we ought to do with pardons is uh, specifically in this this case with uh, possession use of um, of, mar- of marijuana. Now, now is this something specifically? I mean, is is this the board reacting to to, to what public what seems to be public sentiment, which is essentially we want we want some. I don't want to say relaxing, but I I, I think there's a there's a there's a consensus in North Dakota that maybe this is an area where we could take our foot off the gas a little bit. Is that fair? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm using the well, wrong metaphors. Well, I, I think that that's fair. This is something actually for me that has been kind of bubbling around in my mind for a number of years. Back when I was the defense attorney up in Grand Forks, I used to represent clients who were brought into court charged with uh, possession or use of a small amount of marijuana and realize that even if they pled guilty, that the conviction stays on their record for a long time. That was especially problematic because Grand Forks, of course, has the University of North Dakota. There are a lot of students whose career paths require them to have a clean criminal record. Um, and lots of different professions that, that, that caused the problem. And in addition to that, of course, we had the air base there and that caused huge implications for people who are in the military. And that, and I started to think, you know, I think that our statutes ought to be reflective of the seriousness of these offenses. Then I start, when I started here, I, uh, uh, started as a member of the pardon advisory board. Every once in a while, not often, but from time to time, we would get an application from somebody requesting a pardon, um, even sometimes from years and years ago, just saying a, uh, that, A, I've had problems getting a job, or it's caused problems with me getting a place to live, or, or even just because people felt they wanted the record clear for no other reason than they felt that they've lived a life uh, uh, abiding by the law, and, and they want their records cleared. So we typically would grant those, but I started to think, well, why should people come in and go through that lengthy, and I will say that it's a lengthy, laborious process to apply for a, for a pardon. Why should they get a, um, get a pardon and not other people who didn't go through that whole process to ask? And considering the severity of the offense, it seems to me that this is a kind of approach that makes some sense. And yes, sir, you know, there's been some public shift, of course, in the view of marijuana, but it seems to me that if somebody is convicted of a small offense, uh, a relatively minor offense like this, they shouldn't have to have the burden of carrying that criminal record around with them forever. Well, then last session, they, I'm sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. Well, I, I wanted, I wanted to uh, <laughs> finish your thought on last session, and then what I kind of okay. want to walk through step so by la- step what, what's last changed. Session, last session, the issue came up. 
and and two in the uh, initiated measure that was on the ballot about the question of expunging records. Well, nobody's sure what that really means to expunge a record or to seal a record. Things aren't like they were years ago, where the court records were in a paper file and then you could just put a piece of tape over it and then the record was sealed or expunged. You could just shred it or throw it out. Records now are digital. Well, they hit and, the internet, and there's no going back then. Or and there's no going back. If your name was in the newspaper, you'll find that forever, and it's there forever. It created a problem too with us up at the Bureau of Criminal Investigations, where we maintain these criminal records, but we maintain them in conjunction and with an agreement with the federal law enforcement agencies. So we don't have the uh, authority just to go in and start tinkering with these and deleting things out of records that don't necessarily even belong to us. So then it seemed to me that a really smarter way than expunging and sealing and all of that talk to do it was to give people a pardon uh, with removal of guilt, because once that is done, that will be reflected in the criminal history background check. And then after three years after that, then they can be completely deleted. In addition to that, if you get a pardon, what's called a pardon with removal of guilt, you um, um, you can honestly say uh, when asked if you have ever been convicted of an offense that that you have not and because and you've that been pardoned. Is legally and correctly accurate okay and so you know and then i started looking too I, I started wondering well how many people in the state are there that that have ever been convicted of an offense like this and i thought there might be maybe 30,000 40,000 but it turns out we could be looking at upwards of 175 to 179,000 different individuals who have this issue and so of course the pardon board is not going to go through every one of those but uh, in, a, in a regular fashion but I thought that if we could put a, uh, a form and put together a policy that's much less onerous than the typical um, pardon application that goes on for pages and pages put together a short concise um, application and tell people you can get you will get a pardon, and we'll put it on the consent agenda of the pardon advisory board, um, as long as you have not been convicted of another offense within five years. And we will do that for free. A lot of cha states charge hundred or hundred dollars or more for this. We can do this for free. We'll do the background check for free to make sure that people truly did not have an, uh, another conviction in that five years, and then we'll just put it on the consent agenda. We'll uh, look presumably through the names and, and uh, send it on to the governor, who has indicated he is very supportive of this, and he will grant those pardons. Wayne, let me, let me walk you through, because uh, I want to walk through this step by step so people understand what's changing. Prior, what did the, if, if, prior, if, if you had a minor marijuana conviction, maybe like some small possession charge or something, what did the pro what did this process look like under the status for, quo for a pardon for a pardon for a pardon yes yeah uh, you would have to go and fill out a form and and the pay and that form goes on and for good reason on serious offenses for pages they ask all kinds of things like family history treatment history uh financial situation um uh, family relationships, they go on, it goes on for many, many pages, and it takes quite a while to fill it out. And some of that information in a matter like this is either not relevant or too onerous for people to uh, try to bother with it. And so what, what this new policy does in the new application is less than a page and a half, and I think there's like eight questions on it, you know, name, address, telephone number, and then <clears throat> the date you, that you were convicted and what court. And that basically is it. And, and and then they have to certify, of course, that they have not been convicted of another offense within five years. And uh, if that is found to be true, then it will go on our consent agenda for our next meeting, which is now in November. And presumably they will, uh, they will be granted. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward process that doesn't cost anything. You don't need a lawyer. You don't need to do anything except fill in that form. It's on It's online. So you can fill it in online. I think you have to still print it off and mail it in, but we're even working on an electronic submission for that. What sort of charges are we talking about? Like, what's 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 the scope? What's the upper limit for what you can be charged with and expected to be pardoned through this process? The the, the charge through this process is for possession of marijuana, ingestion of marijuana, or possession of marijuana paraphernalia. 
So Just, any of those marijuana usage or possession charges would be eligible. And we're talking about 175 to 179 thousand. You said who who would fall that's, into that it's category? Possible. That's high. Yes. Yeah. Now wow. some you know some of those are people that may be the same person who had four or five cases. So, yeah. You know it's hard to say what the number. Would, would that be a problem? Like if you've been if you've been busted for because I, I know sometimes you said if you haven't been convicted of anything else, if you've been busted you know five times for possession of marijuana paraphernalia, can you get all of those pardoned, or does having more I, than for, one for just that for just that and if five years have gone by since your last offense, that's what we would anticipate we'd do. Wow. And studies show that having this kind of an incentive is something that really does encourage people, incentivizes them not to commit another offense. And I would sure be concerned. If I was on a career path where I worried about a criminal record, I'd I'd make double sure that I'm that I'm staying clean with the law. And, and studies nationwide show that it works. Well, I, I, feel, I feel like across, I mean, that, that's a larger discussion. I feel like that's a larger philosophy that many, in, including yourself, are trying to implement in the criminal justice system is, is we, we sometimes forget that, yes, these people, they commit a crime and they get punished, but most people don't get put in jail forever. I mean, most people okay. are, are yeah. going to, you know, and, and in this case, I'm talking about people who commit crime serious enough to be incarcerated, but, you know, most like, like most of them are going to get out at some point. Right. And I feel like well, we nobody, have... nobody goes to prison for possession or use of right. marijuana. I right. tell you that. We don't have anybody in jail. For right. That and, and, this, I'm, I'm, and I'm talking about like, like the more broader criminal justice uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's just, I feel like just across the board, whether we're talking about minor crimes or maybe more serious crimes for which incarceration is important, it's just important to remember that, that we give them a path back to a, a a responsible life again, right? Like like let's let's clear a path yeah. so that you can go back and and we're not hindering their ability to be what we want them to be, which is law abiding, upstanding, productive members of society. That's true enough, and of course, those that process still exists. The old the old process for other offenses will continue to exist, or even so, you can always follow that process. And even people who may have had a uh, a little more serious uh, uh, drug issue can ask for a uh, ask for a pardon. They have to go through that longer process, but they can do it, and it happens all the time. How many how many pardons does this board issue in a in a year? On well, know, not, that many, not that many, not that many. The ones that come to us, um, you know, we don't issue pardons, of course. All we do is advise the you governor, advise the governor who has right. ultimate constitutional authority. Um, but I would say that it's less than a dozen in a year. Maybe around that amount, but it's not a whole lot. What's the most serious crime you've ever you've ever oh, seen? Where people have asked for a pardon? Oh, yeah. homicides. We get a lot of those. Um, that are asked. We're not very lenient with those, as you can imagine. But we even get people who have had a uh, homicide years and years ago. And sometimes there are records that people have that you do need to know about. Do you? Uh, what's what's the what's the most serious you've ever seen actually pardoned? Oh, you know, I would have to think about that. We, you know, not uh, we, we certainly wouldn't do it very frequently with a homicide, um, especially if they were intentional rather than negligent homicides. But we've seen we've seen uh, some cases, especially where people have have a job, and and now with the regulations about traveling up into Canada, we see some truck drivers who've had some you know, aggravated assaults, maybe or simple assaults in their history, but they cannot go to Canada because that shows up when they try to enter the country and if it's long enough ago uh, we will consider it that is especially true because we always ask the victims if there are any for their input we also ask the judge who sentenced the case and the prosecutor who prosecuted the case what their thoughts are it are on it and sometimes they'll come in and say yes we think that perhaps it's time that he be relieved from this burden and we're 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 very uh sensitive to those kinds of comments what's the difference between this and the legislature just passed a process through which people convicted of d and I, and I guess i'm not have, i don't have the details off the top of my head but and you can fill me in but like after you seven can ask years the court to seal your record that okay. only seals the record in the court it doesn't uh, necessarily change the um, information that's available on a criminal background check in 
um, in, uh, up at uh, PCI. And, and really, more than that, what it requires is you have to file a petition with the court, which means you probably have to have a lawyer to do it. You have to set it for a hearing for the judge to consider the uh, consider the matter. So it's a lengthy and potentially very expensive process to go through. Some people might want to do it, but I think for these offenses, this is a simple, quick and free way to accomplish the same thing. Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, do, do you expect? I mean, when, when does this? I mean, is is this something people can do now? I mean, has this gone into yes. effect? Yes, it's a, the. Uh, if you go to the Department of Corrections website, the form, the application form, is uh, online. The policy was uh, was adopted yesterday by the Pardon Advisory Board, and so um, it's something you can fill out now. There, there's no deadline. You can file your application anytime that you want to, but there is a deadline for consideration of the matter at the no- next meeting of the pardon board, which is in November. And that's just because there's processing we'll have to go through and sure. we'll have to. <clears throat> we'll but have but to basic, basically, you get it in at any time. Once the processing's done, it'll be taken up at the next available meeting. That's kind of how it works. Yes, and and I also suggested, and the pardon board agreed that if if uh, if we have a whole lot of these, there's no reason we can't have a special meeting just to consider uh, consider uh, these applications that have come in because they'll be relatively quick and and straightforward and probably won't take very long. But at the same time, I just don't know how, I know how many people might be interested in applying. I just have no idea. I know I have a rough idea of how many potentials there are. But how many might feel that they want to avail themselves of this is just something I'm not aware of. And we'll find out, I guess, in in uh, a few weeks. Well, we will, but I think it's a good step in the right direction. I, I really do. I, I don't know that you and I entirely agree about what our laws should be on whether or not marijuana itself should should be illegal. But I, I think at least on this end of it, uh, you know, this is a good way to maybe help people uh, like I said, have, have a path back to a, a productive life. Well, I think that's true, and, and we, I guess we probably don't agree, maybe not as much as you think, but, but I do think that the penalties need to be proportionate to the offense and yeah. the length of time that you have to haul around a, a conviction like this when there are so many really needs to be limited, and this is designed to do it, and, and I hope that people will be aware and, and uh, get their applications in, and we'll see how it works. Wayne, thanks for your call. My pleasure, Rob. Anytime. That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. If you want to follow the podcast, there's lots of different ways. All the different podcasting apps, uh, the just search for Plain Talk. It should be accessible. If you're having trouble with one platform or another, email me, Rob, at sayanythingblog.com. I'd be happy to help you out. You can also use that email address if you have questions for our weekly guests or any other feedback on the show. Uh, our weekly guests, of course, Senator Kevin Kramer, Congressman Kelly Armstrong. Uh, we always have uh, a, a good selection of questions every week for them when they're on the show. So I really appreciate that. Follow me on social media, Facebook, Twitter. Just search for Rob Porter, say anything blog. You'll find it. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it. We'll talk again.